This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Barbara Hinsky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft and business of writing as we explore a new topic every week. Our guest this week is Lisa M. Lilly. She is a novelist and a nonfiction writer for writers. Um, I have read and implemented and advocate for one of her nonfiction books, Super Simple Story Structure. Did I get that right? That's a lot of yes. uh, S's. Okay. Um, and her writing blog and one of her newest books is about writing as a second career. And so we are here to um, talk about that today because that applies to all three of us um, yeah. here. And so before we jump into those topics, and Lisa said she's game for this, it's been a while since Barb and I talked about the things that we're working on. And so let's jump in with that. Barb, what have you got going on? So I I will, I've got the bit in my teeth. I will finish my third book in my Paws and Pastries series, Come Hell or High Water. It'll be finished on Sunday and I'll have a title for it, which I have no clue at the moment. And I will have taken a first draft at the blurb. So I'm going to pound that out of myself now. And I've got on, um, I don't know when this is going to post, but on April 6th of this year, my fourth book in my Guiding Emily series, Down the Aisle, will publish. And the audio versions of the second and third book in the Guiding, third books in the Guiding Emily series will publish on May 2nd and June 20th. So that's what I got going on. How about you? Well, I have a follow-up question for you. Yeah. How common is it for you to get this far into the process of essentially being done with the book and not having a title for it? Oh, common. I mean, I, you people who have the title before you start, no, stop. I do not know how you do that. This now will result in me walking. My, my dogs love this face because I get creative when I walk. So they will get long, long walks. It's going to be beautiful. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. It's going to be beautiful. We will walk, walk, walk as I try and think of titles. But you you have your titles before you even start, don't you? You're one of those. Uh, generally, yeah. yes. I at least have a working title. Um, and even for these last two books, the mm -hmm. one I'm currently working on and the one that's coming out here in a couple of months, I try to do a blurb, right? you know, that before I start writing it, just kind of give me a direction. Um, Lisa, where do you fall on that scale? I usually have a working title that then changes often, but I think mine's a little easier because my mystery series is always the something man. So the worried man, the hidden man. So I have that part of it already, which makes that a little bit easier. And often I'm trying to come up with something punchier. I love your idea of writing the blurb first. I did that only once, but I, I felt like it really helped. So you've, you've reminded me that I should do that again. Yeah, I don't, I mean, it certainly changes. Um, and I listened to an interview several months ago now with uh, Michael Brent Collins, who is very good with blurbs and, you know, but his blurbs don't include very much detail. It is all about the hook. And so I'm just trying to come up with that hook and how to grab somebody well without having to know what details are. And, and I can go in and add those. So um, it is not fact heavy. It's more mm -hmm. relies on what's the premise and the problem and how can I grab your attention? Well, those um, are the best. Blurbs. You know, and I want to just comment on these titles. I think, Lisa, your title, The Something Man, is brilliant because you can go endlessly with that. When I started my first series, Coming to Rosemont, you know, I had no idea. So then it was Weaving the Strands, Uncovering Secrets. Well, now I'm, you know, approaching book 10 and it's like, what ING verb as a, am I going to use? So I kind of switched to kind of nods to to song titles in the Rosemont series. But now in Paws and Pastries, Paws and Pastries, number one, Sweets and Treats, number three, two. Okay, boom, boom, boom. What am I gonna do for number three? I think I gotta change it up. So this whole title thing is, is the bane of my existence. 
I song. love the uh, the song link. Initially, my first one, The Worried Man, was I, I quoted from the song, The Worried Man Blues. So I thought I would go that direction with titles. And then for the second book, I was like, there's no song that fits this. <laughs> so I, I, I did find a folk song that had charming in it that kind of fit. But I, yeah, I, it's hard with the song, linking to songs. Yeah. And, and then you get into copyright issues. Yes, it had to be a traditional one that I, that yeah. was not under copyright. Yeah. Yeah. So ugh. anyway. But, so I've been really fortunate to have thought of titles that I liked early on with, so where I'm at is uh, we're recording this on March 3rd. It's coming out in a few weeks. So my fourth novel, Casual Business with Fairies, comes out on May 2nd. I came up with that title really early on, but there was another title I was just toying around with. And so I there's this group of lawyers that I chat with. We're in an online community and there's a books group. Uh, and so I just pitched it to them. It was like, OK, between these two titles, not really knowing anything else which are you most likely to pick up the book um, and end up sticking with casual business with fairies. Um, and so. I love that. A, yeah. I think it, uh, I think it really speaks to what the book is. Um, and so that's coming out and I am just shy of 20,000 words into my fifth novel. And I'm, I have, this is the longest act one of any of my books so far. Um, Cause all of them so far have come in at right around 70 to 73,000 words. So this will be just a little over 20,000 uh, for that, that first act. So it just kind of kept getting longer. Things that I thought would be um, parts of scenes ended up becoming entire scenes and whole chapters. And so they kept being interesting. And so it worked. We'll see if any of it ends up changing significantly. Um, but that's where I am uh, over President's Day weekend. My wife and I took the kids over to Atlanta for a couple of days because they have this really great aquarium over there. And on the way over there, I figured out in great detail how the third act is going to resolve. Prior to that, I... And it's, it's mystery, it's suspense. Um, I had a general idea of how things were going to work out and had just, you know, I've been mulling it over for months, even before I started writing it, because I've only been actively writing in it for two months, because um, I started on January 1st with this one. And so I just kind of been trying to figure it out. And then all the dominoes just fell into place. And I told my wife, like the premise of the story. And then here is how I think it's going to resolve. And there's, of course, since it's suspense, there's going to be a twist. And when I got to the twist, she was like, oh, and I was like, okay, that's, that's a good response. Um, and so now I just have to write, you know, like the next 75% and we'll be good to go. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Just, Thanks. just the other 60,000 words. It should be fine. <laughs> all right. So Lisa, what are you working on? I am about to do what I hope is my last rewrite that should be somewhat major of my sixth mystery novel in my QC Davis series. And this one is really close to my heart because uh, the backstory of the character is that she was named for a sister who was murdered before Quill was born and her parents gave her the same name. So this has always kind of hung over her. And in this book, she now has solved a number of crimes in in the other books she goes to try to solve this uh, decades old murder of her sister and another little girl who was killed at the same around the same time so it's a very emotional one for her and it also required a lot of interweaving plot lines so i'm really excited about that and while i've let that sit so i can get a fresh look i've been editing uh, I do books based on my podcast, Buffy and the Art of Story. So the podcast is on season six. The books are only on the beginning of season three. So you can see it's a much longer deal, but I've been making my way through that as well. So I'm I'm now going to take a break from that and go back to fiction. 
All right. So you go with your podcast, you go episode by episode through Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes. Um, has this increased or decreased your affinity for the show? Probably increased because I will get to episodes that in my memory, there are very few of these, but in my memory where I think, oh, I'm, I'm not, I don't really love that episode. And then when I break it down and look, I look at the story structure, I look at characterization, I look at how it fits in the arc of the season as a whole. And I'm often just blown away by how much is in there. That is amazing. Uh, and I learn a lot from the things that I think are not working as well. But yeah, I think it's made me appreciate it even more as I take it apart to try to see what are they doing with this and how do they do it? So we just... Wait a minute, let's make sure we know because my daughter will be all over this, as will I. What again is your podcast where you do that? It's Buffy and the Art of Story. So she can, if she wants to listen, she can start from the very first one and I do one episode at a time and look at it from a story perspective. But I also recap the whole episode. So a lot of listeners tell me they had thought they would rewatch the episode and then listen, but often they just listen. And they, some of them aren't even writers. They just like re, you know, reimagining that story or hearing this each story again. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited she's a fan of Buffy. She is. Yeah, brilliant. She'll love that. It's her birthday, so now I can be a hero. Oh, great. Surprise. There you go. <laughs> yep, on podcasting. Yeah. So we just did as a couple of days ago in real time, and it will be probably a couple of weeks ago as far as air dates go, an interview with Valerie Francis and talked about story theory. Mm -hmm. Um and because in her podcast, Story Nerd, they take movies and take them apart and talk about various elements. Um, so doing a deep dive into Buffy, which you've done for years now. Yes. Um, how has that affected or benefited your own fiction writing? Mm -hmm. It has helped me with mainly with characters, which is interesting because I started it to look at the plot. Um, because as you know, I, I write a lot about story structure and I thought this is a great way to dive into the show I love and also help other writers think about story structure. So it, it certainly doubles down on that. Like there are certain plot turns where I think, oh, that is a great way to do that. But also the way, while it is a very plot oriented show like it's it's action it's horror it's a thriller so strong plot turns how the characters fit and how well developed they are and also almost every time it doesn't work for me it's because the characters i feel like they're breaking the character to make it fit the plot mm -hmm. and i i feel like that's that's my tendency as well as an author because I tend to be plot first and then figure out the characters to go with. Other than my main characters, usually those are pretty strong. So it, it helped me spot that when, mm -hmm. when I do it because it's always easier to see it in someone else's work. And it also made me feel a little better that even these writers who are at the top of their game and so amazing, you know, you, you can't always get it all perfect. And even they sometimes have times when, at least I think, Oh, I don't, I don't believe Willow would do that. Like, I don't mm -hmm. buy that Giles would be that way to Buffy because I'm in season six right now. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so that I've probably learned the most on characterization. Well, in that show, so I have only watched it through once and that was probably 15, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, you need to watch but, again. <laughs> I know, but well, what I was going to say though is I have such a strong recollection of who those characters are because mm -hmm. that show just has such good characters. Yes. And yeah, that is pretty amazing when you think if you haven't revisited it and yet you you still think, oh, yeah, I know who she's talking about. Yeah. And I, they're just so vivid. It's just a show with great characters. Yeah. Um, so let's go to. I forgot where I was going to go. My train just derailed, <laughs> which may be a bad analogy right now. Oh, um, uh, yeah. But so let's talk about this writing is a second career for you. So let's start with going back in time and kind of walking us through 
what your first career was, how you got to writing, and how that's evolved. Yeah, so in some ways, uh, writing in a way was was first for me, but it wasn't what I made a living at first. Um, I took writing in college, fiction writing, basically just because they would give me a degree in it, which I thought was great. Um, and I did a lot of office work and temp work. I went to law school at age 30, so I had about eight years in between. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, you did too? Okay. Well, I actually, I graduated from law school, through, but I had time in between. Yeah, yeah time. Yeah. And I, and it's, it's a different here. way. <laughs> yeah. Graduated at 30. So uh, we're uh, all, yeah. 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 And, and so I think there are some parallels there between like you bring something different to mm -hmm. law school and being a lawyer when you have done other things. And likewise, I see writing that way. But I used to always say, even back when before law school, I would do these temp jobs, but I'd say, well, I'm a writer. I'm making my living right now, you know, doing executive secretary stuff or doing word processing yeah. or doing computer things. So when I became a lawyer, it was a real mindset shift because law, uh, my other jobs, I could much more easily work around my writing. And law is, it's, it's different. It's not nine to five for most of us. And a lot of the advice that is out there for writers, uh, especially at the time, I feel like was very much geared towards someone who had the kind of job where when they left at five, one, they got to leave at five, and two, mm -hmm they were done and you might be stressed from the job, but no one was calling you at seven at night or there wasn't something happening at, you know, five o'clock on a Friday where now suddenly you have to work all weekend and you really can't change that in the moment. So for me, the writing as a second career, I always thought of it even then as I care about writing as much, writing fiction as much as I do about law. Now, when I practice law full time, that had to come first because you have commitments to clients. Uh, even if it's your own firm, you know, you don't have a boss, but you've got clients and, and that's an important thing. So that came first, but carving out that time to write fiction, devoting resources to it, how much I cared about it was equal to law, it just had to be much less time spent on it. So I started the website writing as a second career because so many lawyers I knew would call me and either say, I've written a book, uh, how should I publish it? What should I do about it? Or I want to write a book, but how, how on earth do you find time to do that? Or they would refer me, you know, hey, my accountant wrote a book and wants to talk to someone about it. And I, at first, I would send people these emails with, oh, listen to this podcast, go to this site. And they'd always come back and say, uh, you know what, could you just talk to me? Could you just sit down and have lunch with me and explain it? So I started the site partly as a, here's a place to put this information here for people in a similar position. And a lot of it is time management. It's also about writing, writing craft. And a lot of my approaches to writing craft have to do with coming out of when I had almost zero time to write. So what were ways that I could make that easier? Uh, one last part of writing is a second career. When I started it, the indie publishing space was pretty new and law was even perhaps more formal than it is now in terms of, you know, how people dress for court and for conferences. And I would go to these events and the people presenting, it was more like the IT world. There'd be some guy in a wrinkled t-shirt and, or on a video and it looks like he's in his mom's, you know, basement bedroom. And I'd think, well, what, what can this person know? They can't be a professional, but I would listen and I'd learn a ton. And I realized that was a real barrier for uh, if you're in a profession that has certain ways that people are supposed to present, uh, you have to kind of get past that to say, oh, just because people teaching me online marketing don't put on a suit doesn't mean they know, know what they're talking about. I think that that has balanced out more over time. Like that space has gotten a little bit, a little bit more formalized and then other professions have gotten a little more relaxed. But at the time that was part of some of the lawyers who called me they didn't want to go learn from that online seminar because they didn't trust it. But if I would basically tell them the same thing, they could hear it because they knew that I had this other profession that they respected. 
sounds to me like you were incredibly generous with your time. I mean, all those people coming at you for just, just want to talk to you or just have lunch. I've had some of that too. And after a while, you're like, I, you know, no, I don't have time. I can send you my list of resources. So maybe that's what your site did was kind of let you fill that need, but not personally with every craft it for every person because you just can't. That was part of it. That way I could say, okay, here is my site. If you have questions, I'm happy to talk with you. So after that, more often, it was someone I knew well, which was how it divided out. So when I'd like to catch up with, sure, let's have lunch. I'm happy to tell you these things. If it was a couple more steps removed, I might send them to the site. And here and there, I will do some coaching for people who really want that, who want to talk to me one-on-one -on, -one on a regular basis. Because yes, exactly. At, at, at some point, especially when I was running a busy law practice, I didn't have that many hours to yeah. spare. Yeah. So when you, let's talk about practicalities of people who have a profession uh, or, or work, but it's not a profession, but familial obligations, those things, mm -hmm. and don't, they want to write um, or they want to you know, publish, they want to become professional in this too. How, what are some steps you advise for creating that time and opportunity to get that writing work done? There are a couple of things. One is I found I had to think of time in a different context. So when I worked more of a nine to five and at the time didn't have any other real responsibilities, I could say, okay, Wednesday nights and Saturday mornings, I will write and I'd write, and it might be even more than two nights a week and Saturdays. So I could write 12 hours a week. As a lawyer, I had to think of it in more of a, um, I would think about, okay, over four months, what would I like to accomplish? It might be a word count goal rather than an hour goal. And and I did that long time frame because maybe there'd be a month in there when I was literally spending every waking hour at my office, eating there, you know, not not sleeping there, but pretty much working all the time. But then then it might ease off and I'd have more time. So I'd try to look at it as a bigger picture and set my goals that way. I'm a very goal-oriented person. Mm -hmm. And I had to track it in a different way. I started thinking about word count instead of time spent. And uh, an, a writing instructor I have called it the spare change method of writing, where rather than I'm going to do the same time every day, it's, oh, where can I squeeze in 20 minutes? Where can I squeeze in an hour? Oh, I have two hours here. And you said something that is exactly what I did a lot of, which is you said, as I was, as I was driving to the aquarium, I think it was, uh, I, I realized what would happen in this part of the book. So I did a lot of uh, much more thinking and planning and I'd sit at court and I would have a legal pad with me and I'm waiting for my case to be called and I'd be scribbling about my character. Oh, why would she do this? What if her dad was a colonel in the army? How would that change things? Or I need this to happen. Uh, also, I, was, I still do this. Maybe before I went to sleep at night or before I went to work in the morning, I would think about a question I had. Maybe it was... I, I don't know what's going to happen in the middle of the book. What is a major reversal that could happen to my character there? And I'd have no idea, but I just ask myself that and I'd ask it every night. And after a few days, things would start popping into my head. And when I had 10 minutes before a conference call, I would just make some notes. I was very big on making notes. Mm -hmm. I used a lot of sticky notes and then I would take all the sticky notes home and I didn't always even read them, but when I did sit down to write, I knew where I was going. Yeah. So I did much more, won't necessarily work for everyone, but I did much more planning, much more detailed outlines then, so that when I had that hour, I could just sit down and write, right? I wrote much faster then in a way because mm -hmm. I had spent so much time thinking about it or standing in line. So a lot of it is really using that downtime. And then last thing, um, and I talk about this in my book, The One-Year Novelist, 
breaking it down, like really breaking down the parts of how you write your story. I tend to do it in order because I'm a linear thinker. So I start with my protagonist and what does that person want? What's their goal? What does the antagonist want? Are those two things in enough conflict? But you can split it out any way you want, but it breaks it in small chunks so that when you have 15 minutes, you could really accomplish something with that, where in the past, I wanted these big chunks of time. And that's still what I prefer. I prefer to write for a couple hours at a time, but really for probably 20 years, I couldn't. That was just not possible. So if you can find ways to break down your process and have small things so that you don't spend 10 of your 15 minutes trying to figure out what are you going to do? Are you going to think about character or plot or theme or are you going to write or are you going to you know are you going to write scenes or a character sketch if you can think about that in advance and then you just pick something off your list and and work on that i that strikes me as virtually the only way to do it to make use of smaller blocks of time um so how long have you been now you're a full-time writer correct Yes and no. Like, yes, that's the biggest chunk of what I do. But I, I was just telling Jeremy before we started that I do some project work for another firm. Okay. And uh, last year they had next to nothing for me, probably the whole year, 10 hours. And then this year I've already done more on, on a busy case they have than in probably the three prior years, years combined. So here and there I'll have legal work. Yeah. I also teach legal writing like one semester a year, just one class. But otherwise, yeah, there are long stretches when all I'm doing is my creative work. Excellent. That was a really long answer. And I think you were going somewhere else with that. No, that's perfect <laughs> um, yeah. because it describes what I have had to do. So for context, the book I'm writing now will be, or I guess is my ninth book between my my fiction pen name and my um given name it's my ninth book the first one came out in 2018 um and so to be able to do that while i've had a, a busy law practice i have a dedicated time like first thing in the morning um that usually somewhere between 45 minutes and an hour and 15 minutes that that's my writing time but and sometimes it's other creative stuff um i've published a handful of books for other lawyers um and so it, it might be time i have to work on that like it was this morning um or podcast related stuff and so but that's my creative time mostly writing but i also use this spare change approach as well of mm -hmm. when I'm, you know, if I'm picking up the kids from school and I'm in car line waiting for 15 or 20 minutes, there have been plenty of times that I have taken my iPad that has Scrivener on it and make sure to sync it up before I leave um, so that I can just pick up and write for 15 minutes. Or you talk about um, court. There have been plenty of times where I go to a docket call in, in the rural counties in Alabama, there will be judges who they serve multiple counties. And so what they'll do is in this particular county, they'll call every case that they have. They will set it for those lawyers to come on that day. And so you'll have a hundred cases waiting for wow. just the judge to say either we're ready for trial or we're not ready for trial or like we're having some problems that we need you to do something about, whatever. But there's just a whole lot of time when you're waiting that you're not, you don't have any responsibilities until your case gets called. And so I'll pull out, you know, my phone and with Scrivener on my phone or even just notepad, um, you know, the notes app or whatever, and have like 4% of my attention devoted to when my case gets called um, and the other devoted to just, Maybe it's outlining, maybe it's working on a project, maybe it's I thought of a line of dialogue mm -hmm. on the way here, and I need to write that down or else it will disappear into the ether, never to be found again. Um, and then you write that one dialogue line down, and then, you know, an entire conversation flows out of that. So it's that 
I'd set aside the specific time to do it, but I also make opportunities when I have them because aside from maybe the weekends, but not even that really, I don't have multi-hour opportunities to sit down and write. Um, and so it has to be something that you as the writer, if, if you say this is a priority, you're going to have to make the time for it. And there may be times like you mentioned, there may be times in your life where it's just not going to happen. Um, things going on with family, things going on with work, with home, uh, improvement, renovation projects, whatever. There's going to be times where it can't happen. But if you want to be a writer, you have to find a way for those to be the exceptions and not the rule. Yeah. And I think you, I, I like your point about having both because mine usually when I was running my practice would be, or even when I was working at another large firm was usually Friday nights and Sunday mornings because almost never did I have to stay at the office on Friday night because I worked on Saturdays. So if something happened, I could go in earlier on Saturday and the Sunday mornings, likewise, usually I, I didn't usually work all weekend. And so those were, I think it's good to have a default time that if there are no emergencies, if there is nothing that you truly can't put aside, yeah, those are the times you write. And as you said, if, if you want to write, you want to write a novel, you want to write short stories, you need to figure out when those times are. And I think it's important to be realistic too, that you, when often they talk about well, what, what can you give up? Like the example of it used to be TV, how much TV people watch now, it would probably be scrolling the internet. But you've got to be realistic about, can you completely give that up? Because it could be that your brain needs that time to not, not be engaged with things. So it's important to experiment too and figure out, is that something I can skip? Or am I going to end up just doing it anyway and feeling guilty, but maybe there's something else. Uh, and that's the other thing about a second career. If your first career pays reasonably well in, and you can afford it, you may be able to think of other things that you could outsource essentially. And it doesn't have to be a writing thing. It could be, um, I, I hate cleaning and I have tendonitis in my hands. So like scrubbing really aggravates that way earlier than I could really afford it. I paid someone to clean so that I wasn't using my hands for that. And so that I could spend that time writing. At one point, I think I was paying more than I was earning very early on, but it was worth it to trade out that time. So that's another thing to think of too. Like, are there things you could trade away or pay someone to do? I mean, I think it deserves mentioning, well, first of all, that you could write, have the mental uh, ability to write or do something productive on Friday nights. Cause when I was working, I was always way too fried. But I think the whole point of this is so many people, many lawyers particularly want to write books, but it takes the tenacity and the discipline to really commit to doing things. And I think nobody thinks it's ideal to write on your iPad for 15 minutes while your car is idling in a pickup lane. Um, that doesn't seem very, um, you know, like the writer and something's got to give and the, you know, breeze are blowing from the Northamptons beach or whatever she was. That's all ideal. That's not what it is. Yeah. But if you really want to do it, then you will do it. And I think that's, you know, kudos to both of you who are still in that spot where you're doing other things. I do a few other things too, but um, I've got much more time to devote to my writing. It's just a whole lot easier now. I think some of it for me too was writing was my escape, which makes it easier. Mm -hmm. I loved fiction and I had a, a, an odd experience when I was able to kind of flip my life so that on average, you know, probably three quarters of it is creative and a quarter is the other things where it used to be more like, 5% creative and 95% other things. And I've had to figure out, oh, what is my fun thing? What is my escape thing? Because that Friday yes. night, it took energy, but it was also like, oh, yay, I get to do this fun kind of writing. And 
I ran into this thing of, oh, well, I'm doing this all day now. Like, what, what do I do to unwind? I would take writing vacations. I'd either go to a formal retreat or just go off somewhere and write. And now I'm like, oh, that isn't really feeling like a vacation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's that aspect too, where I think it's important for people to think about what do they love to write versus uh, maybe what you think you should write or what you think would sell, mm -hmm. which I still tend to just pursue, what do I love to write? Because that was always my, my escape. Yeah. Well, I want to go back to something you said a couple minutes ago about, you know, there may be things in your life that take up time, but it's important not to get rid of them. Um, because, you know, there's been science about the importance of boredom which I am very bad at allowing myself to have any opportunity for inactivity. Like I'm just yes. bad at being inactive, but yeah. what I do enjoy is yard work in part because it is so, it's so mindless. I can yeah. put on a podcast or listen to an audio book or think about my own writing and just kind of let things marinate and yeah. just kind of percolate on that back burner and even when I'm not actively mm -hmm. thinking about them it is like bleeding stress away even though I live in the deep south and it is 95 degrees and 95 percent humidity and like in the air is so thick you have to cut through it at times like yeah. doing that yard work is important to me um for a lot of reasons including having that opportunity of letting my brain be inactive and just work through whatever creative stuff I wanted to work through. And what sometimes that's intake with, you know, with the podcast or books. Um, and for me, painting is the same way, like, like painting a mm -hmm. row, not painting for art of, of things that are mindless and occupy time and space, but allow you to do other things. And so, you know, there may be, chores that people have or responsibilities that you have that mm -hmm. occupy time but not necessarily attention mm -hmm. yeah your brain needs a a, re a break from always accomplishing things i agree with that i play the piano and do jigsaw puzzles that what about you lisa what do you do to kind of give yourself some breathe brain breathe I I walk a lot. So when you mentioned earlier that you know you were walk you have to take a walk with your dogs and you'll come up with ideas, that for me uh, I live in Chicago and for since 1990s I have walked to work or walked to classes, uh, usually a mile, mile and a half. Now that I work from home entirely, I have to go out and take a walk, mm -hmm. and it's both for good health reasons, physical health reasons, because I hate other kinds of aerobics. So this is all I can, this is all I can do. Um, but it's, it's also those ideas. That's where I let my brain go. Cause like Jeremy, I tend to fill, fill it all the time. My brain is always working on something. And that's when I, I kind of just let go and walk and often mm -hmm. things just pop into my head, but I'm not trying to make that happen. So I try to do about 30 minutes of walking every day, either split up or at once, even when the weather's terrible, uh, which it often is here in the winter. <laughs> well, I think that is a really practical, good note of where to leave off. And before we go, I want to make sure people know where to find you and your work so that they can continue to accrue ideas to help them be uh, both more creative and have the opportunity to do good writing work. You can find my fiction and links to my nonfiction at my uh, author website, lisalilly.com. That's L-I-L-L-Y. Um, or at writingasasecondcareer.com. You can find articles and blog posts about writing as well as links to the writing books. And you can find the podcast Buffy and the Art of Story either on your favorite app or on my author website. If you do lisalilly.com slash Buffy, you will get there. Well, thank you so much. I have thoroughly enjoyed the conversation um, and have plenty of things to take away from it to continue to try and be more efficient. So thank you so much. 
Thank you for having me. This was great. Yeah. Take care. You too.